been pretty quick. Many of y'all are aware that Mike Williams is not feeling well, and he's not going to be with us on Sunday. So let's play a little trick on him. Johnny Estep is going to be here, and he'll be preaching with us on Sunday. He's the fellow that y'all heard just a few weeks back that is our uh, missionary to the Philippines. Make sure you're here and invite as many as your friends as you possibly can. Let's fill this building up, okay, on Sunday. And then that'll kind of shame Mike that people will show up for Johnny Estep, okay? <laughs> so that gives you a challenge for this week, okay, guys? Our speaker tonight has come from the furthest away, uh, from Dripping Springs, uh, which is uh, barbecue heaven to most of us. So over dinner tonight, we spent most of our time talking about different barbecue places in and around the Austin area. But Jacob Rutledge uh, graduated from Southwest School of Bible Studies and Heritage Christian University. He and his wife, Jessica, have three children, uh, Natalie, Easton, and Lincoln. They started off with the church in Atlanta, Texas for four years, but for the, since 2015 have been with the Dripping Springs Church of Christ. I've heard great things about him. I've seen a couple of videos. You're in for a real treat. Jacob, it's all yours. I'm gonna move this up just a little bit because I seem kind of far away from you. <laughs> well, good evening. And grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so good to be here with you this evening. Uh, so good to uh, be in this area. I don't really know if I have spent much time, if any, in the Kaufman area. And so I'm thankful that I get a chance to, to be in this area and to spend some time with you. I was uh, enjoyed grabbing uh, dinner with the Langstons earlier, such a good fine couple, and uh, I know I didn't know the connection that we had. I didn't know that I knew their uh, son-in-law, and Jacob and I are good friends, and um, which, by the way, I did get a little bit worried earlier when they said Jacob was about to lead us in singing. Um, I thought, well, I didn't know that was a part of the deal, but okay. But it, And now I'm a little bit worried about your challenge, because my wife just texted me and said, we've got a full house tonight, you know, so maybe they were given that challenge too, but it is good to to be here with you tonight and to study this wonderful series of lessons that you're going through and hope that you have your Bible on you. We'll be looking at some passages together. But as we were, as I was studying for this uh, subject and getting ready for this lesson, I couldn't help but think of my great-grandfather, my papa, who played football for the Navy back in the 40s. And they all ha always had a picture of him suited up in his football gear back in those days. And I was looking through some pictures the other day and saw that picture in the background. And my papa had uh, suffered from a stroke in the late 90s, and which made it impossible for him to walk, and he uh, struggled with his speech some. But we would watch football together occasionally, especially on holidays. And I remember one Thanksgiving, we were watching a football game together, and I thought it was somewhat ironic, the, the contrast between this old-time football player watching the new and advanced technology that these players were wearing and the professionalism that surrounded it. And so I leaned over and I said, hey, Papa, I said, those helmets that they're wearing out there on the field, those are a little bit better than the ones that you wore back in your day, aren't they? And he turned and looked at me and he said, helmets? We didn't have shoes. <laughs> I think he was exaggerating a little bit. But when it comes to sports, when it comes to football, concussion protocol, CTE, helmet design, all of these things have been at the forefront of sports media, particularly within the last decade. Because more and more medical professionals and sports are finding out the importance of properly protecting your head when you're going to engage in a possibly brain damaging scenario to connect and to protect against any possible or to minimize the amount of concussions that you get. So there's been a big discussion within sports for quite some time. Of course our military has known the importance of protecting your head for 
many years. They know that sometimes the difference between a deflected bullet and a deadly bullet is proper headgear. And so it shouldn't surprise us when we come to Ephesians chapter 6, and Paul is using this metaphor to discuss the spiritual battle and the spiritual armament of the Christian, that he emphasizes the importance of properly protecting our head, of ensuring that we have the right headgear on. And so he says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 that we are to take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And that's our topic for tonight. And it's right before he mentions the sword of the Spirit, which is in some ways connected. And we'll talk a little bit later about how, but I'm not going to step on the other brother's lesson in that. But if you would just for a moment allow me to extend that metaphor a little bit of headgear and our spiritual battle, our spiritual walk, when it comes to following Jesus Christ. Because while Paul tells us to put a helmet on here, there's a lot of other caps, a lot of other headgears that we're probably more comfortable wearing than a helmet. A lot of us are pretty comfortable wearing ball caps. That is, we like to focus on sports. We like to talk about sports. We breathe sports. I'm an avid Texas Longhorn fan. I hope that doesn't make some of you look down upon me, but I'm an avid Texas Longhorn fan, and I love football, love watching football. But we easily can become consumed with sports without even thinking about it. When we talk to people, the things that we talk about are sports, our small talks about sports. We're constantly thinking about sports. When it comes to our kids, the only priorities that we make are sports. And then when somebody wants to talk to us about spiritual things, when someone wants to talk to us about eternal things and important things, we become uncomfortable with it because we're much more comfortable wearing a ball cap than a helmet. Some of us are more comfortable wearing a hard hat than a helmet. We're constantly focused on work. That gains our attention. In fact, when we come home, we can't think of much else. We, 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 we struggle to focus on our wives and on our children and our spouse and on our husband. We focus a lot on the deadline. We worry a lot about the deadline, but not so much about Judgment Day. We help our children. We get them ready for their careers, but we never cultivate their souls. And most of us are much more comfortable wearing a hard hat than a helmet. And then I think also that many of us are probably a little bit more comfortable wearing a sun hat. And what I mean by that is that we're constantly focused on the next fun moment. I've noticed that um, we didn't get to take many vacations last summer, and I don't know how it is here, but I feel like our church has been on constant vacation this summer. <laughs> I'll be going on vacation uh, next week with my wife for our anniversary. But, but if we're not careful, we can become consumed with just our own comfort, and our own pleasure. And that's our only focus. We're focused on finding the next fun thing. We're never righteously zealous about anything when it comes to the church. We're never righteously indignant about any of the unholiness and ungodliness within our culture. And in fact, we get angry with the people who try and push us out of our comfort zone and put us to work within the kingdom because we are comfortable doing what we want to do when we want to do it, and how we want to do it. And we wear that hat of apathy joyfully. And we're a lot more comfortable wearing that than we are a helmet. But in contrast to all three of these things, Paul says you should put on the helmet of salvation. Now, brethren, that is the activity of warfare. That is an action that speaks of being prepared, it's an action that speaks of sobriety. It's an action that speaks of preparedness. It anticipates battle whenever you put on a helmet. It assumes the reality of attacks. If you're putting on a helmet, you're assuming that you're going to be hit. You're assuming that there are going to be blows to the head. If I saw someone walking around Walmart with a football helmet on, I'd be a little bit worried. Because they aren't going into that scenario. If you put a football helmet on, most of the time you're going to be playing a football game and you're anticipating the blows. So when Paul says you need to put a helmet on, he's saying as Christians, you need to be ready. You need to anticipate that there are going to be blows to the head. And so it understands the importance 
of clothing our thoughts, our motives, our desires in the things of salvation. Philippians 4 and verse 8, whatever things are pure and lovely, of good report, think on these things. It assumes that the primary battle, the primary battleground of Satan is right in here, is within the mind, within the will, within the intellect, within the heart. It understands that that's where Satan is going to attack. And it understands that that is how Satan is attacking the world, within the mind. And that's what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 when he says, you are fighting against spiritual forces of evil. Now, I don't know if he could use greater language to make us tremble in our boots when it comes to this life. You're fighting against spiritual forces of evil. And the only way you're going to be able to engage with that properly is if you have the helmet of salvation on. And so what this tells me about the helmet is, number one, that it primarily protects against dark forces. It protects me against dark forces. Now, when it comes to spiritual battle, when it comes to spiritual warfare, we cannot play dumb when it comes to Satan. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, he says, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. So he says, you can't play dumb and act like you don't know how Satan works. We know how Satan works. Now, at the same time, we also know that Satan and sin is very cunning. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, remember how the serpent is described? He's cunning. He's more subtle than we sometimes anticipate him being. And so, on one hand, as the church, we're well aware of how Satan works. But on the other hand, we also know that sometimes Satan can be working even when I don't realize he's working, because he's cunning, and he is subtle. And so, therefore, I don't want to underestimate Satan, and I don't want to overestimate myself. I don't want to, and this is why, by the way, when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he teaches them to pray to God, lead me not into temptation. That is a confession of weakness. Lord, I realize that I can easily be led into temptation, so lead me out of that spot. And so we won't want to underestimate Satan. We don't want to overestimate ourselves. In fact, Did you catch in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, I'm sure that that passage has been alluded to in previous lessons, how Paul tells them there to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not Jacob's might. His might. Any strength that I have when combating with these spiritual forces of wickedness come from God. And if I try and use my own strength, if I try and use my own wisdom, my own craftiness, my own intelligence, I am going to fail each and every single time. So I need to be strong in the Lord and in His mind. But we are well aware of Satan's tactics. We are well aware of sin tactics. Satan goes for the head. He goes for the head. He didn't kill Adam and Eve. He lied to them. Right? You ever think about that? Well, if he doesn't like humans, why didn't he just kill them? Because he can do much more damage by lying to them. And so from the very beginning, we are informed that spiritual, he- spiritual forces of wickedness get into our head. They want to affect the intellect, the will, the emotions, the desires. The very thing, mind you, that makes us in the image of God. That's the part. That little spark is what Satan wants to attack and influence. So he uses a variety of tactics. Probably his most popular one is deception. And within deception, Satan offers and sin offers an alternative consequence. Now what I mean by that is, If you watch a movie, and and you watch that movie, and you get to the end, you don't start that movie over 
thinking that there's going to be a different ending, right? It's the same ending. It's written in the code. It's, it's going to be the same ending every single time you watch it. But isn't that how we treat sin a lot of times? We keep doing the same old sins, and humanity has been doing the same old sins from the very beginning, thinking that the ending is going to be different thinking that there's going to be an alternative consequence to the sins that we're doing, that shouldn't surprise us because that is how Satan works. In the garden, in Genesis chapter 3, Satan offered an alternative consequence to what God had told Adam and Eve. You're not going to die. God said you're going to die. Listen, God's making a way bigger deal of this than it actually is. You're not going to die. In fact, you'll know more. And so by presenting that alternative consequence and deceiving them, he had won the battle for the mind. Jesus, of course, called Satan out for what he was in John 8 and verse 44. He said he's the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. What beginning? This beginning. Genesis chapter 3. And yet, he keeps convincing us that our way is going to turn out differently if we just do sin the right way this time. But of course, that isn't true. Just look at the constant sexual abuse scandals that we see almost, it seems like, every other month within our nation from those in positions of power. I don't know about you, but whenever a new headline pops up, says someone's been convicted of some new sex scandal, I think, why haven't they figured this out yet? Don't they know that they're going to get caught eventually? Don't they realize that? Why do they keep doing it? Because the snake got into their head and deceived them and offered them an alternative consequence. That is how sin works. The second tactic that is often used by these spiritual forces of wickedness, if it's not deception, then it's illusion. That is, it presents or paints a different reality. God had told Adam and Eve the truth. If you eat of the tree, you're going to die. And yet Satan offered them a different picture, a different reality. Instead of extermination, it would be enlightenment. You're not going to die. Your eyes will be opened. You'll know more. You'll be like God. In this reality, they wouldn't be hindered by God's boundaries. But they would be their own gods, apart from the true God's restrictions. And this is how sin wins the day. By convincing us that there is a different reality, one where our actions don't have consequences or morals or will be held accountable. Think about it. If Satan can convince us that in life you will never be held accountable for your actions, there are no, uh, there's no accountability for your morals, if he can convince us of that, he doesn't have to force us to do evil. We will freely do it ourselves. And that is why the push within our culture for relative truth, no real objective truth, no right and wrong, is so prevalent and so dangerous and caused so much harm in our world. Why are these individuals acting in this way, doing these mass shootings, slaughtering so many people? Why are they doing that? Now, there might be a variety of reasons as to why they say they're doing it. But behind all of it is the belief that they will not ultimately be held accountable for their actions. And when Satan can convince someone of that reality, when he can get their head and convince them of that, then the battle is won for him. The third most popular tactic, if it's not deception, if it's not illusion, and this is probably at the heart of both of those, is accusation. And what I mean by that is that in the Garden of Eden, what we are seeing by the serpent is a full frontal attack on the character and the person of God. That's really what this is about. Did you ever catch that? Did God really say... God's not worried about you. He just knows that if you eat of this, you're going to be like him. What's he doing there? He is causing Adam and Eve to question 
the power, the provision, and the person of God. God doesn't really have your best interest at heart. He's just trying to hold you back. He has too many rules, too many boundaries. By the way, have you ever noticed that God blessed Adam and Eve with everything they could have ever imagined? He even tells them, look, I've made you all this good stuff. You can eat of it. You can do all this. And he has one rule, one rule. And Satan still convinces Adam and Eve that that's too restrictive. And once he had done that, he had won. And they had lost. This is the reason why Satan is called the accuser in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Generally speaking, he's talking about the accusations that he makes against us before God. But in many ways, he accuses the character of God himself. Remember Job, when Satan comes to God? and, and, And God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And do you remember what Satan says? Has Job served you for nothing? That's an attack on the character of God. The only reason Job is serving you is because you give him a lot of stuff. You take away the stuff, he'll curse you to your face. God says, let's see. And so if Satan can get into your head, if he can convince us that God doesn't really love us, that he doesn't know what he's doing, that he doesn't keep his promises, then he has won the war for our minds. And like any good relationship, if trust is broken, everything else begins to unravel. And so if Satan can't get you by deception or illusion, he is certainly going to get you by accusation. He will call into question the character of God. And it is because of these spiritual and intellectual assaults that Paul says you need to, number two, encompass or encase your mind with salvation. Now the reason that I use that language is because generally speaking when you think of a helmet, specifically during the time that Paul was writing, you're thinking most likely of a Roman, like a Roman centurion helmet, which I think is appropriate. I think that's the imagery that he's using here in which the soldier's head would be encased within metal to defend against the blows of the enemy. Not only, and I thought about this as well, not only was it protective, but it was also unavoidable when it came to being viewed within the peripheral vision of the soldier because it had these metal flaps that would come down. And so it was constant, he was constantly aware of it. It was unavoidable for him. And in many ways, the, the helmet was the cherry on top of the armor. It was the final piece which protected the most vital part, which was the head. But what does it mean for you as a Christian to put on the helmet of salvation? Does that mean that you need to unfold your Bible and start wearing it around on the top of your head? What does that mean? Well, number one, it means that we need to guard our minds with truth. We need to guard our minds with truth. If Satan is the great deceiver, then the only element that is strong enough to stop the illusion is truth. And this is why Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will free you. It will set you free. Set you free from what? The deceptions, the lies that you have bought into within your life, that sin has given to you, and you have bought in full scale into. It breaks the illusion to where your eyes are suddenly aware of your own sinfulness and your need for salvation and how good God is. That's what the truth does. And so if we're going to put on the helmet of salvation, we have to be diligent in guarding our minds with truth, specifically the truth of the gospel, which Paul talks about, just summarizes it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3, the things of utmost importance. That Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day. That is the true story. That is reality. What God has done within Jesus Christ, within his death and within his resurrection, that is the real thing. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of the story of the cross. How often do you think about Jesus during the day? How often do you think about the message of the cross? How often do you really think about what the resurrection means? 
How often does that come into your thoughts? If we're going to be diligent about fighting against the deceptions of this world, then we have to be diligent about imbibing and partaking of God's Word. And we have to be diligent about guarding our hearts and our minds with the truth of God. More than ever, the church must recapture a genuine devotion to knowing and living and speaking the truth of God, no matter how hard that might be. We must accept the reality that we live in a culture and we specifically live in a generation that hates truth. We live in a generation that hates and despises truth. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10 talks about those who refuse to accept a love of truth. You see this at the most fundamental level within our culture with the promotion of things such as homosexuality and transgenderism. It's a denial of reality at its most fundamental basis. Why is that? Because our generation hates truth. It is a faithless generation, as Jesus would say. And so speaking truth, no matter how loving, no matter how graceful, uh, no matter how kind, in a generation like ours is going to be viewed as hateful. Now we shouldn't lose hope. Uh, We shouldn't be disheartened because that's the exact type of generation in which the gospel was born. Do you remember what Pilate asked Jesus when Jesus says that I came, John 18 and verse 37, I came to testify of the truth. This is the reason I came. Do you remember Pilate's question right after that? What is truth? Now, if Christianity can be born within that culture, it can be sustained within that culture. So we don't want to lose hope, but we have to recognize not only that we live in a generation that hates truth, but how easily that can influence us. So we have to guard our minds with truth. The sword of the Spirit, which, which will be talked about later, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God in action. The helmet of salvation is the Word of God in meditation. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God in action. The helmet of salvation is the Word of God in meditation, and you cannot separate those two things. Number two, we put on the the helmet of salvation by feeding our faith with the promises of God. Again, if Satan is accusing accusing the character of God, then I have to be diligent in defending God's image within my own heart. If he accuses that, uh, 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 God's character, putting on the helmet of salvation means that we know God's promises and we know them well. And we speak them to each other, and we speak them in our own hearts. They are the foundation for our life. The psalmist says in Psalm 15 and verse 2 that the person who can come to know God is the one who speaks truth within his heart. And so if I want to put on the helmet of salvation, that means that I sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, need to remind myself of the promises of God and feed my faith on that. God has made promises, and God has been faithful to those promises, and all of those are culminated within Jesus Christ. God was faithful to his promises to all of humanity and to Israel, and all of his promises are culminated within Jesus Christ. And if he fulfilled those promises within Jesus, he's going to fulfill the promises in the future. That anchors my faith in God. You have to be constantly on guard against what the culture is telling you about God. You have to remind yourself of how faithful God is because the culture is more than willing to try and convince you that he is faithless. Number three, I put on the helmet of salvation when I fill my thoughts with hope. I fill my thoughts with hope. Satan would like nothing more than to convince the church that the present battle for our world and culture is hopeless. Listen, I've been there. I know how discouraging it can be looking around and watching the news and seeing all the things that are going on in our culture. But I also know this, that there could not have been a more darker time in human history than when the Son of God came into the world. And yet through his life and through his sacrifice and through his resurrection, he did something incredible. And I also know this, that the Lord is still present with his people. 
When Jesus told his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Brethren, that is a promise. And is Jesus still fulfilling that promise right now? Amen, he is. He has not abandoned us. He has not left his people. He is with us. The question is, will we join with him? Will we grab his hand? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8, he talks about the helmet of salvation there. You probably didn't know that because we're so focused on Ephesians chapter 6. But 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8, he words it a little bit differently. He says, and put on as a helmet the hope of salvation. Be hopeful, he says, Christians. Be, we would say it this way, be optimistic. Is it okay for Christians to be optimistic? We can be pretty pessimistic sometimes, can't we? (laughs) Paul says, be optimistic about the future because God is in control. Hope in the salvation that you will receive. Putting on the helmet of salvation and the hope of salvation means that I need to remind myself of three things. I need to remind myself, number one, that God has forgiven my past. God has forgiven me. I'm justified. Number two, I need to remember that he loves me in the present. He has forgiven my past. He loves me in the present. And then number three, he's waiting for me in the future. And that gives me hope. God has taken care of my past. He is actively loving me in the present. And he is waiting for me in the future. And that is the foundation for my hope and my salvation. So whenever you're struggling with guilt over the past, sin in the present, fear of the future, you need to put on the helmet of salvation and you need to think on these things. Fill your mind with hope within the work that God has done and is doing and the great promises that he has made within Jesus Christ. Now, Salvation is a past and present event. We're saved in a single moment, justified, but we're also being saved, which is sometimes referred to as sanctification. Sanctification is the process of becoming more like Jesus. And if you're not being sanctified, you're not being saved. The scripture over and over again talks about this process of sanctification. And he says that the cross is the power of those who are being saved, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. So we are justified, but then we also, there's a process of being sanctified. Because I'm telling you right now, when I come up out of that baptism, I, I don't look a whole lot like Jesus. I'm saved and I'm justified, but there's still a lot of work that God has to do on me. And he is still doing that work right now. And he will be doing that work till the day I die or he returns. And so salvation is hoping in and being confident in the past, trusting in God in the present, and looking forward to God in the future because of what he has done within Jesus Christ by his grace and by his mercy. And we need to, that, that should make you hopeful. That should fill us all with hope. And if we could just grasp these three concepts, we would recognize that number three that transformation of mentality leads to a transformation of activity. That a transformation of my mentality is going to transform the way that I act and the way that I live. And that's really what it means to put on the helmet of salvation. If I'm just thinking about salvation and it never is displayed within my life, then it's not doing me a whole lot of good. Don't be just hearers of the word, but doers also deceiving your own selves. James 1 and verse 19, there's that deception word. You know how easy it is to deceive yourself? Now, this is a scary thought. If you've never thought about this, you need to think about it a little bit more. (laughs) How easily it is to convince yourself that you're saved when you're not. He said, don't deceive yourself. What do I mean by that? It is easy to convince yourself that you're saved by coming to this church building on Sunday for a couple of hours listening to a lot of good stuff in the pulpit and then going out into the world and it never really makes any tangible difference in your life. But you've convinced yourself that because you've come here for a couple of hours during the week that you're saved. 
And that's exactly what James is talking about. If you're constantly imbibing the word of God, you can think, well, I'm a pretty good Christian. But if, unless it is actually changing you, unless it is actually transforming you to be more like Jesus, you've deceived yourself. Now, we're talking about sanctification. We're not talking about perfection. The process of sanctification is a battle. That's why we have Ephesians 6. It's a battle for the inner man first, and then in the outer world second. And so, if we could get those concepts down, if we could put on the helmet of salvation by guarding our minds with truth and feeding our faith with the promises of God and filling our thoughts with the hope of salvation, then we would see this transformation within our thinking our mentality, and that would lead to a transformation of our activity. And if we as Christians can learn to fight off the deceptions of Satan by truth and hope and the promises of God, I think we would witness two things. We would witness, number one, more confidence in ourselves. More confidence in our salvation. Only a fully suited soldier can go into battle with boldness. If you had a Roman soldier come up to you, and you gave him a sword and a shield and some boots and said, all right, go on. He's not going to be very confident going into battle. Why? Because the most important part is exposed. But if you give him the helmet, he can go out there boldly. If our head isn't protected from the false accusations of Satan and the world, we will not have the confidence to engage in spiritual war warfare. The blows come to the head from Satan. And if you're not fully protected, resting your hope in the grace of God, resting your hope in the gospel of God, then what's going to happen is, is you're going to try and go out into spiritual warfare, you're going to get hit on the head, and you're going to have a lot of self-doubt, you're going to be struggling with guilt, and then you're not going to get into the battle. And so we have to put on this helmet of hope and of truth in the gospel so that we can be confident. There is a boldness that comes with grace, Hebrews 4 and verse 16. A boldness. Why? Because I'm free. I am free, and it's not because of me. It's because what God has done within Jesus Christ. The grace that he offers us within him. So I think that we would see more confidence. And number two, I think that we would be more convicted as Christians if we learned how to put on the helmet of salvation. I'd be more convicted about, if I'm, if I'm confident in my salvation, that makes me more convicted about the salvation or the lack of salvation of those around me. I'm more convicted about that because I'm constantly thinking about it. This is why you cannot wield the sword of the Spirit without the helmet of salvation. If you get a blow to the head, then you can't wield the sword. If you are not thinking biblically, if you're not thinking right biblically about yourself, you're not going to think right about other people, and you're not going to use the Word of God to try and help them. How often do you think about the lostness of the people that you come into contact with every day? How often do you shake hands with someone that you know is going to hell? And yet we feel very little conviction to talk to them. Why is that? Most likely because we have not put on the helmet of salvation. We haven't thought about our own salvation. We haven't thought about theirs. And people suffer the consequences because Christians are going out into the world and they're not fully armored. And so placing this helmet on is important for yourself, but also for those that are around you. And so if I have the helmet of salvation, I'm confident, I'm convicted, and then thirdly, I'm complete. Again, the armor is not finished until the helmet is on. And a lot of times we go out into the world and we're not fully ready to engage with the battles of the world. We're not really fully ready. Have you ever had one of those days where it seems as if Satan is just attacking you left and right, where you're being more tempted than normal? Maybe there's struggles that are coming up that are discouraging and you're despairing. And then you start thinking about it. And you know, you know what? I woke up a little bit later this morning. I haven't prayed to God today. I haven't read scripture. I haven't worshipped him. I haven't spent any time in communion with God. 
And we're going out into the world unprepared, and we are not complete. But when I put on the helmet of salvation, and I'm feeding my faith with the promises of God within Scripture, I'm, I'm reminding and guarding my heart with truth, I'm filling my thoughts with the hope of God and the good things that Paul talks about in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Through the Word of God and through the power of God's Word, as he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17, I become complete. Do you know what Paul's saying there when he says that the Word of God makes you complete, lacking nothing? What he's telling me is that I can't be the man that God wants me to be. You can't be the woman that God wants you to be without the Word of God. This is what makes us complete through His power, through His Word, and through His Son. Now, as we kind of start coming to a close here, if you're looking out at the world right now, and you're thinking to yourself as a Christian, that the rest of your life is going to be a battle. You're looking how the world is going, and you're thinking, man, it looks like things aren't going to be get better for a while. This whole Christian thing is going to be a battle for quite a while. You are absolutely right. Of course, the reality is, is that it was that way before. We convince ourselves sometimes that Christianity is supposed to be easier than it actually is. Even though God, even though Jesus, over and over and over again says, this is tough. It's a battle. It's a struggle. The battle first takes place within here. And then from that, it goes out into the world as I try and help others and show them the love of God. It is a battle. A battle of truth. A battle for righteousness and holiness and goodness. We are taking part in a battle, in a, in a war that far exceeds our imagination. We are battling with cosmic powers, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. We don't even conceive of that sometimes. And the mundane, what's, what are seemingly mundane actions, which you view are mundane, in which you fight off temptation, in which you're faithful to God in your weakness, in which you speak to someone about Jesus Christ, in which you convert someone to Jesus Christ, and when you come and worship God, even though the world is telling you it's pointless, even though the world is telling you it's stupid, when you do all of those things that seem mundane to you, Paul says that you are taking part in the battle for your soul and for the soul of the world. But the promise is, according to Hebrews 4 and verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. But before we receive the crown, we must strap on the helmet of salvation. Before the crown comes the helmet. And every day we put the helmet on, never once taking our own salvation for granted, Philippians 2 and verse 12, to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. You know what Paul's saying there? You handle your salvation like fine china. You handle it with trembling hands. We are ever vigilant, seeking new opportunities to share the gospel with others, always envisioning the glory that awaits us, that hope that is there, and it drives us to seek out others and to share in that glory with them one day, hopefully. The world does not need a hard-headed church, but it does need a helmeted church. It needs a church that is confident in its convictions, that knows the truth of God, that is uncompromising and unwavering when it comes to the gospel and when it comes to God's word. But being a helmet to church is much more than just being hard-headed. It, it means being filled with grace and mercy with those around us, loving our enemies, reaching out to them, talking to them and saving them if we can. This is what it means to put on the helmet of salvation. I'm very thankful to be here with you tonight. I'm very th I forgot to ask, do we have an invitation or we just close now? Do we have a song? We just close it out? Okay. Why don't we say a prayer together? Our God and our Father, our Lord, we come to you so thankful for this opportunity to study your word. I'm so thankful, Father, for the Landmark Church, for their love of you, for their love of your word. I'm so thankful for everyone here tonight. 
And Lord, we pray for your mercy upon us. As we humble ourselves before you, we pray that we strap on the helmet of salvation, that we fight against the deceptions and illusions and accusations of Satan by guarding our hearts with your truth, by feeding our faith on the promises of God, and by filling our minds with hope, Father. Help us to be more confident and more convicted as your people as we go out into the world. It's in your son's blessed name that we pray. Amen.